This is Kim Turner of the Queen Anne Historical Society. We're here at Mount Pleasant Cemetery on the top of Queen Anne Hill doing a virtual walking tour of the cemetery because of the COV-19 situation. As you may or may not know, this kind of cemetery is a very modern step. It was uh, between 1750 and 1800 that the cemetery as a park was, was, uh, uh, was created. Formerly you had churchyard cemeteries or you had estate cemeteries that belonged to individual families and were located on their estates. So this is essentially a, a modern innovation and the idea was that you would come to the cemetery and be able to picnic here with your ancestors close by. Anna Herkleis was one of the beautiful people of Denver, if you recall the lines from the unsinkable Molly Brown. She was one of the people that Molly wanted to emulate and uh, by the time Molly became famous, Anna had moved with her family to the Pacific Northwest. Her uh, husband's brother had come up here and discovered that this was an excellent area for growth, for buying real estate, investing in the land, and so the family moved up here. Anna became known uh, because she was one of the women on Queen Anne Hill who got together with other wives and helped to form the Children's Orthopedic Hospital. Her son, one of her sons, died just prior to 1900 from a, uh, an illness that had him in the hospital, but because there was no special children's hospital, Children were kind of ignored in favor of adults in the hospital system. So they decided there was a need for a hospital just for children. So they got together, brought monies together, and the Children's Orthopedic Hospital, which is now Queen Anne Manor, was the result. It was started in 1911, and it now is in the uh, southeast portion of Seattle. Here we are at the gravesite of the former owners of the cemetery and their parents who were owners before them and then of course the Kleist family with whom we just uh, met were the owners prior to the Edwards family. The Edwards took ownership of, or I should say custodianship of the cemetery in the mid-1950s and it has been in their family ever since. We're talking some 40 acres of grave sites and potential grave sites. There are between 40 and 50,000 people already buried or interred in the cemetery since the uh, beginnings back in the late 1800s. Loretta Edwards was a pistol and probably one of the nicest people that you could meet, but she chose her friends very carefully and if she didn't like you, she didn't play around. She just uh, ignored you. <laughs> Her husband, Bill, was in my sister's graduating class of 1959, Queen Anne High School, and uh, his major contribution to the uh, upkeep of the cemetery was playing golf around the grounds and also uh, keeping his archery prowess going by uh, sailing arrows into various trees and whatnot. Uh, both of them are gone now, and uh, other members of the family now control the cemetery. Their parents, the older Edwards, were the uh, uh, inheritors, if you will, 
from the Kleist family and uh, ran the cemetery in a proper fashion. Uh, the car that you see on the gravestone was uh, used to be over by the flagpole next to the office and uh, that was where uh, Bill first learned to drive going around the various roads and pathways in the cemetery. He also took a number of his friends on rides in that same vehicle. It's no longer in the cemetery. We're here at the gravesite of Anna Miller, a small child who was uh, barely a year old when she died. But because there's um, international interest in her gravesite's location, we wanted to include her in our walking tour this year. We're here at the gravesite of Catherine and David Blaine. In 1848, Catherine signed a document back in Seneca Falls, New York, which was one of the first pieces of paper to uh, suggest that women needed rights equal to men. Prior to that time, a woman could not own property. Her husband, or her father, or her uncle, or her brothers, or her male cousins, should her husband die, for example, she would not inherit. The male, the nearest male relative would. So this was uh, considered by most women as uh, something that needed changing. Unfortunately, it didn't really get changed completely until 1920 when women had their uh, equal right to vote, which should have been from the very beginning, but that's something else. Anyway, Catherine and uh, David Blaine came out here in 1853. He founded the first Protestant church and she was the first school teacher in Seattle. They left the area uh, shortly after 1856 when her son was, one of her sons was born during the Indian attack on Seattle in January of 1856. And they didn't come back to Seattle until 1882 and remained here the rest of their lives. They're considered uh, among the most significant founding fathers because of the fact that they brought both a Protestant religion and school teaching into Seattle proper. We're here at the gravesite of Bertha Pitts Campbell, one of the uh, former activists in Seattle. This is a very special paper, the Kitsap Sun from Sunday, August 16th, 2020, the centennial of women's rights to vote. And uh, Bertha Pitts Campbell, although she never, as far as I found, she never went to Kitsap County, uh, she's one of the 10 important women of the century for Seattle area. She was uh, one of the founders of the uh, women's sorority at Howard University in Washington, D.C. in 1913 and went back there for the 75th anniversary of the founding of that same sorority. Uh, marching in a parade, almost 90 years old, and uh, when she came out to Seattle, there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, separation between blacks and whites. And uh, she, when the, when the Coleman swimming pool was uh, open, she stood up for the rights of blacks to use the pool at the same time as anyone else. And she won the point and the uh, pool was one of the first integrated places in Seattle. 
She died in her 101st year, having accomplished a great many things for equal rights. Didn't she also march with the suffragettes? Well, yeah. Um, the thing is that we don't know that much about what her uh, involvement was. Because, of course, that was back in 1920, and she was still back east, and then afterwards taught in Colorado for a short number of years before she and her husband and their son came out to Seattle, which was in the 1930s. Anyway, she was a mover and shaker, one of many who are interred here at the cemetery. In January of 1906, the Pacific Northwest had a uh, maritime disaster, which was essentially its version of the Titanic, which was to come another six years and on a totally different ocean. During the night of January 22nd, the steamer Valencia, which had made a number of uh, trips between Seattle and California, was uh, trying to get through the Strait of Juan de Fuca and come up Puget Sound to Seattle. Unfortunately, they did not have a uh, ship to shore radio back then and they had no way of knowing for sure exactly where they were because there was a uh, fairly good storm and uh, close in to shore, a fog. They thought they were 30 miles from where they actually were and they went on the rocks on the uh, southern end of Vancouver Island. The sad thing was that over 150 people died, mostly women and children, and there were only 37 survivors. This is one of two monuments. The other is up on Vancouver Island to honor the people who died in this tragedy. In the first part of the 20th century, labor unrest was uh, simply a matter of fact particularly in the Pacific Northwest, but all over the country. The uh, industrial workers of the world formed in the uh, late 1890s and early 1900s and uh, wanted to encourage more laborers to join. The uh, main problem was that the owners of the sawmills didn't see laborers as worth their hire. And they were not insured. Many of them lost limbs during their working hours with the large saws, etc. Anyway, summer of August of, eight, of 1916 were particularly rough and uh, people had tried to form a union in Everett in the late summer but they were driven out of town on the railroad and uh, most headed to Seattle. Well, in November, November 5th, two boats, uh, essentially excursion boats, the uh, Verona and uh, her sister ship, whose name I forget right now, uh, set sail from Seattle to Everett with a number of labor uh, practitioners heading north to uh, have a meeting in one of the council halls in Everett. When they warped into the wharf, the Verona was met by the county sheriff and uh, a whole number of people who had been deputized, who were mainly goons working for the sawmill owners and uh, they didn't uh, allow anybody to get by them. And they said, who are your leaders? And a voice came back from the boat, we are all leaders. Uh, at some point, a shot rang out. Uh, many people think that it came from the hill above the wharf rather than from the either group 
but it caused, of course, immediate gunfire on both sides. The end result was that at least seven members of the IWW were shot, uh, one of the sheriff's deputies and the sheriff himself were shot. Um, and so the, uh, with all the gunfire going on, the captain of the Verona uh, tried to put the gear into reverse and hid behind the safe in his cabin there because it was the only place that he could escape being riddled by bullets. Uh, the Verona backed off and met its sister ship, the Callista, on the way back to Seattle and uh, told them, don't, don't go any further because they're shooting us. Uh, the end total were approximately 11 dead from the laborers and two from the uh, sheriff's side. This stone was erected by the Russian colony in Seattle because uh, at least one of the fellows, Hugo Gerlot, was uh, an expatriate Russian American. So those who are, uh, remains are buried here was one of the largest cemetery parades from downtown Seattle all the way up Queen Anne Hill to the cemetery where they were laid to rest. In 1997, the uh, 60th anniversary, 60th, 70th anniversary, no, 80th. Anyway, one of the anniversaries of the interment, which was in May of 1917, uh, again, a large crowd showed up, but they were from St. Anne's eighth grade history class and were accompanied by members of the Queen Anne Historical Society, Isabel Eglin, John Hennis, and Delbert Lobeter. Del and Isabel are no longer with us. John is living in retirement in the North End. Uh, Paul Dorpat accompanied them and took pictures which appeared in the column Seattle Now and Then in the Seattle Times. We are here at the gravesite of Luigi Cimarusti, who was a railroad worker for the Great Northern Railroad back in 1910. The uh, stone was put into place by his son, who came over from Italy to do so. Luigi was one of the 96-plus victims of the Wellington Avalanche on the uh, night of March 2nd, 1910. There were over 96 people killed, but because uh, James J. Hill, who owned the Great Northern, and the previous record number of deaths by railroad was 96 back in Colorado in 1904, told his men, when you found, 19, when you found 96 bodies, stop counting. So he didn't want to have the worst disaster in railroad history in America on his conscience. Unfortunately, he did. The uh, number of survivors of the Wellington Avalanche consisted of another 37 people. Remember, 37 survived on the Valencia. Uh, most of those who survived did so because the night before the avalanche, they walked west uh, over the 12 to 15 foot mound of snow all the way to a small substation west of Wellington. The uh, disaster was such that it essentially wiped out the town of Wellington. It took two trains and hurled them, literally hurled them, into the river gorge below. And up until very recently, you could see the remains of at least one of the engines down there in the river. Uh, the interesting thing about the Chimarusti grave is that there are actually 29 people buried here. They were, uh, none of the others were identified. 
but they were most likely Japanese or Chinese laborers who worked for the railroad. And therefore, at that time, they didn't really count. So no names. But there are 29 people interred in this gravesite. We're here at the tombstone of Sam Smith, former Seattle City Councilman, who was an African American who served as one of the first African Americans on the state legislature and later in the 1960s was elected as city councilman to the Seattle City Council. He served in that council position for uh, a fairly long time, uh, having to retire in the early 1990s due to complications from diabetes. When you called his office, you didn't get a toady, you didn't get a secretary, you got Sam Smith himself. And he was always an affable, helpful, and concerned councilman. We're here at the gravesite of Dimitri Korahorgi, who was born in uh, 1880 in uh, Trieste, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but who died in Seattle in 1973 at the age of 93. Dimitri is part of our tour because he is our first Medal of Honor winner to be buried in the cemetery here. Uh, he served aboard the USS Iowa off the coast of Haiti in 1904. He, his ship, somehow or other, two of the boilers burst with hot scalding water washing over the entire interior hold and engine room. So volunteers were asked for to go down and try and retrieve anyone who was still alive down there and he was one of the volunteers. He did go down there, apparently saved two people's lives and brought out at least one more body. And uh, for the rest of his life, he had burn scars on his lower legs and had a lot of pain gendered from that incident. But because he'd done that essentially above and beyond the call of duty, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. He came to Seattle in the late 1920s and was uh, married to Helen, who uh, was a Crassel. Her brother is buried here. Her mother, his mother-in-law, remains between the husband and wife, just to keep them honest. <laughs> Helen was a uh, noted photographer in uh, one of the downtown uh, small studios, but uh, she gave that up when she became too ill to hold a camera. We're heading now to the Bagley's. We're here at the grave sites of the, I should say the family plot of the Bagley family, one of the major movers and shakers in early Seattle history. Reverend Daniel Bagley is the man to whom credit is given for the naming of Queen Anne as a neighborhood. When uh, the early gingerbread structures were built here and he was coming to what was then called North Seattle, people would say, are you not going out to Queen Anne Town? And the name stuck. And of course, it has been Queen Anne ever since. The original North Seattle, which is at the foot of the hill, is now called the Uptown District. And it's definitely Uptown from Downtown. Daniel was a, uh, uh, a good man, a mover and a shaker. But his son, Clarence, whose gravesite is over to the, west, to the south here, was uh, even more important in the history of Seattle because 
he was from the uh, 1870s to the early 1880s the uh, editor and owner of the Seattle Daily Intelligencer, which became the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And uh, his major claims to fame are in 1916, he wrote the three, or had published the three volume history of Seattle. And then in 1929, three years before his death, a three volume history of King County, both of which are major works and uh, uh, considered highly credible in the history that they promote. Now Clarence's wife was one of the Mercer girls, uh, not the Mercers who came from Boston, but the four daughters of Thomas Mercer, who was one of the first uh, owners of uh, property on what is now Queen Anne. Uh, Susanna Rogers Whipple, who married Daniel Bagley, she was one of five sisters from uh, Massachusetts, one of whom was one of my relatives. So this is my connection to the Bagley family. We're moving on to our last gravesite, Carlos Bulosan. We're here at the bench where we began uh, some time ago. We're redoing the uh, description of the grave of Carlos Bulosan, Philippine-American, who was a uh, mover and shaker in the uh, field of union organizing and being a gifted poet and writer. He was born in the Philippines in either 1911 or 1913. History is a little vague on that point. He came to Seattle in 1930 and worked with the uh, uh, migratory workers up and down the West Coast from then until about 1950. Uh, his writings, well, to begin with, he got beaten savagely by a number of the anti-unionists who uh, uh, caused him to develop tuberculosis and uh, later pneumonia, uh, which eventually, which led to his death in Seattle. He was a very gifted writer. He wrote uh, poetry and essays up until the early 1940s when he was tapped by President Franklin Roosevelt to write one of the Four Freedoms. And so he wrote a four-page dissertation called Freedom from Fear. And it's a beautifully written document uh, and also a cautionary document for people who come into America from outside thinking that this is indeed the gold mountain or land of opportunity. You have to have seed money in order to make it work. At any rate, in 1946, Carlos wrote his autobiography, America is in the Heart. Uh, it's a very moving autobiography and uh, it kind of predates his death in 1954. Uh, which was due to complications from both tuberculosis and pneumonia. He died in an uh, uh, inexpensive hotel down in Pioneer Square, and his grave is here in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. The stone was put in place by the Associated Philippine Students of the University of Washington in 1982. Uh, the major uh, collection of his writings, correspondence, etc., is on file in the University of Washington Special Collections and is definitely worth seeing. They had it on exhibit about three years ago and it's probably one of the most, I have to say, one of the unique collections that I have seen of any writer's materials, photographs, as I say, letters, manuscripts of some of his own works, and uh, a huge correspondence, both union and non-union. Uh, definitely worth seeing. And now I'm going to turn the, uh, the walking tour over to our president of the Queen Anne Historical Society, 
Michael Hirschenson. Michael. Well, Kim, thank you ever so much for another wonderful tour of the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. It's always a lot of fun to visit these grave sites with Kim. And if you have any questions about any of the grave sites, about the Mount Pleasant Cemetery or the Queen Anne Historical Society, write to us at info at qahistory.org and we'll get back to you with answers as soon as we possibly can. Thank you very much, and thank you for having taken part in this inimitable walking tour.